Hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the speaker series. My name is Grace. Uh, I'm Mike. And um, we are super duper excited uh, today uh, to talk about sell sheets, uh, which are so important these days uh, for pitching and everything else. Uh, and we have with us the best of the best uh, sell sheet person we know, uh, Sen Fung Lim, uh, come on the stream. Hey, everybody. Nice <laughs> to see you. Good to see you, too. How are you today? I am fine and dandy here in wet Ontario, Canada. It is raining. It's been raining for like three days straight. It's kind of yucky, but that's spring. That, that'll bring us some flowers in May, I guess. I suppose that's that's the whole idea. That's right. That's that hard work for that sweet reward, which is uh, kind of folds into what we're going to talk about today, right? <laughs> I guess. I mean, sure. <laughs> <laughs> making a sell sheet is like raining. Yeah, <laughs> this metaphor is a little too mixed yeah. for me. I, well, we're going to get into a lot of metaphors, I think, having seen the yes, first slide of this. we are. <laughs> so just quickly for everybody, uh, we are the Tabletop Mentorship Program. That's uh, your host, host organization today. We put this speaker series together in collaboration with New Voices in Gaming and Tabletop Network. Uh, so thank them so much for allowing us all to be here. And we see people coming in. Oh, it's so nice to see everybody gathering and having nice sunny weather in Florida. Very jealous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> very, very jealous. Absolutely. Uh, and we real quick want to thank our sponsors on Patreon as well. Uh, Curtis Fry and Angela Pelsel. So thank you so much for all your support. Um, and just so you know, after Sen's workshop, uh, we're going to do a Q&A with Sen. And if you're a member of the Tabletop Mentorship Program, you're in our Discord. Um, we're gonna ask you to post your sell sheets. Uh, so pull that document up, work on it uh, during the workshop and then post them in the Discord. Uh, and We can bring it up uh, and get Sen's expert uh, critique and feedback there. <laughs> <laughs> do something like that, yeah. <laughs> It'll be super fun. That's right, it's gonna be super fun. All right, so I think we're ready to get started, yeah? Yeah. yeah. All right, cool. All right, Sen, we're gonna put your presentation up and we'll let you take it away. Thanks so much. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So. Uh, hey, welcome everybody. My name is Sen, and I hope you like to go fishing because that's what we're going to do today. So um, we're going to talk about crafting sell sheets to catch that that big one, land that contract, land that big contract. And so today there'll be a whole lot of fishing analogies. <clears throat> Why? Because um, I got stuck on the word hook over the last couple of you know months, thinking like I don't think people really understand what a hook is because I, I really don't know if you do. And, and that's kind of where I want to go today is teaching you about the idea of the hook versus the bait. Uh, and I think people know what the bait is, but I don't think people actually really understand fully what a hook is. So uh, let's get going. Um, just as a, a, a thing, is there a way to get... There we go. Perfect. That's much better. <laughs> There's a lot of little text there. So who am I just to start? Uh, I am the co-designer of over 30 published tabletop products in cardboard and RPGs. Uh, I've been a writer and developer on over 20 uh, published tabletop products beyond those 30 that I co-designed. I'm the co-founder of All But Published and The Pitch Project and on the advisory committee for the Game Developers Conference as well as New Voices. I forgot to write that down. Sorry, New Voices. I know you sponsor this. Uh, <laughs> I'm also the co-host of the Meeple Syrup Show and just got announced. I'll be co-hosting Ludology with Erica, who's also a Meeple Syrup co-host, and Gilova. Uh, Emma is stepping down for a while. And last but not least, I'm a professor of behavioral and developmental psychology, as well as communication sciences uh, for developmental services workers. So people who are paraeducators, uh, people who work with people with developmental delays in the community and home and school and work. So that's my area of expertise. And I bring that to this because there's a whole lot of psychology and communication in the art of selling. And that's what we're going to talk about today because it's super fun. <laughs> I say that with a little bit of a, a dryness to it because it's, I mean, it's fun for me, but I know it's fun for you. But if you want to get your game sold, sell sheets are a really good place to start. Um, what exactly is a sell sheet? So Luke Laurie, who is the award-winning designer behind games like you know Everdale and What's Stop and things like that, 
he says that a sell sheet is dot 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 a one page document that is given to a publisher that includes exactly the right information and kinds of information uh, that a publisher needs to know whether they should take a closer look at a game. No more and not less. Huh. Hmm. That's really important because it's this it's this real fine balancing act uh, of of how we sell to a publisher is actually dependent on what a publisher needs to be able to do. So I want you to think about that. Who is the audience? We're going to ask that question a little bit later. But publishers need to be able to do a bunch of things. They need to be able to sell your game using copy, like ad copy, words, on their website or back of a box. That's one thing. Uh, second thing is they need to be able to sell your game to customers at their booth, right? And they also need to be able to sell your game to distributors and stores. So if you can't, they can't. Meaning if you can't sell your game to them in the same way that they need to sell their games, you can't sell. They can't sell it either, right? So when you have a sell sheet, what it is, it, it kind of is a template for them to see potential, for them to see the ability to put into words and pictures the experience of the game, which we're going to talk about in great detail today, because that is truly what the hook is. The hook isn't, oh, a cool component or nice themes or good art. It's part of it. Uh, but the experience, the overall experience is really what we need to be focused on. And if you can't sell them on your game, they won't be able to sell anybody else on your game. Or at least they won't think they can, and therefore they'll pass. Right? We want to land that big fish. We want to land that, we want to catch that contract, right? All right, so Luke told us what a sell sheet is, but what's the purpose of it? A sell sheet indicates the game's target audience. And if it indicates a game target audience, you should have, as the designer, tested it with those audiences as widely as possible so you know that it fits within that age range, those numbers of players. You should test it at all numbers pretty equally, right? Um, it could conveys the game's experiential pro promise. And this is a huge one. We're going to get into the theory of experiential design a little bit uh, as we go on. And uh, it's just a really important kind of overarching thing, literally, that you need to understand about games and game design and how to sell an experience. Because that's really what we're selling. It evokes the game's theme. So a sell sheet should evoke the theme, should look like it belongs in that world should have parts of that artistically uh, <clears throat> use the phraseology but without going too deep in the weeds remember the experience is paramount the theme is supporting that experience <clears throat> similarly the mechanisms are des described in brief we don't need to go on a you know line by line every single rule but we've got to teach people a little bit about how this experiential promise that we've made to them is realized through the game's mechanisms. We can't teach the whole game, but we can actually focus very well on that key, key, key part of the game. If we need to do that, we then need to identify what is that key part of the game. What is the promise we're making to the publisher I promise you, publisher, that when you play this game, you will feel X, Y, and Z, right? And the last thing about the purpose of the sell sheet is, is basically why I put it on a business card before, is that a sell sheet really is like a mini business card, uh, or sorry, not a mini business card, a big business card. It's a bigger business card uh, that includes the designer's contact information as well as other pieces of information that you might think are useful for your potential publisher. All right. So, <laughs> what is that experiential promise? Uh, I threw this up online a, a couple weeks ago, like maybe yeah, in December, November of last year. And uh, some feedback is that it's not perfect because it's not. Uh, that's the, the basis of theory anyways, is that we refine theory over time. But think about it this way. So, a game is a house. The analogy of a house. I wish I could have done this in fish, but I hadn't drawn the fish picture yet. A game is a house made up of four walls and a roof, right? A house is made out of four walls and a roof. There's a foundation there. And my friend Dylan said, oh, you should go with a foundation because you can't see it. And that's maybe better for mecha mechanisms. It's like, oh, maybe. We'll talk about that later. But uh, in the experience, the roof 
is supported by four walls. We need to understand what the four walls are. The four walls are the theme and the mechanisms. And then there's two other walls. And those are those arrows going between theme and information where theme informs mechanisms and mechanisms, mechanisms inform theme. And this is one of the areas that I think people um, kind of, especially newer designers, may fall down in, in the idea that, oh, I'm a theme first designer. Oh, I'm a mechanism first designer. And let me tell you 100%, theme and mechanism do not sell games. Experiences sell games. And that's a really, really important thing to kind of get into your head, that that roof, that overarching roof of the experience at the end of the day is what's going to sell you the game in the long run. In the short run, theme and mechanism may be more apparent because they're easier to talk about. But in order to really sell your game, you need to be able to sell the experience. Because when you look at a house, like when you look at a bunch of houses when you're far away, all you can see is the roofs. And that's really what you want to get at. All right. So the experience is the key thing that we are trying to sell to our audience when we pitch. We can use the, we can use mechanisms to do that. But in end, it's that overarching experience, that experiential promise that we make. Hey, publisher, when you play this game, I promise you, this is what you're going to experience. All right. So that goes back to game design a little bit, inconsistency of, of, of results and outcomes. but. That is also what we're selling. So I'm trying to tell you, please avoid or reduce the amount that you talk about your theme and your mechanisms and increase the amount that you talk about your experience, the experience that your game provides, the experience it creates around the table with live people, right? Now, there are definitely people who buy solely based on theme or people who, you know, they want every spy-themed game. That's me. I love spies. So spy themes games are great or people who like really like roll and write mechanics like Sue's from the dice tower you know if it's roll and write she'll try it uh but there's also a reason why we like those themes and those mechanisms because most likely they're indicators of an experience that we like i like bluffing and i like you know cheating and lying and stealing i mean it doesn't look like i do but you know what i mean like i like doing that in game terms and that experience is usually supported by games that have a uh, spy theme, right? Okay, move it on. So let's talk about sell sheets specifically. This is a sell sheet that I whipped up on Canva, of all things. Canva, by the way, is free and great. And if you get the paid version, it's even greater, but just not freer. It's more expensive. Uh, but I whipped this up in like, I don't know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes on Canva to make a quick sell sheet when somebody said, hey, do you have a sell sheet or one pager for that game you played with me the other week? I said, yeah, here it is. So I'm not going to say this is perfect. I'm going to say it's it's got the eight essential elements. Whether or not the wording is perfect or anything like that is, is debatable. Uh, and that's a thing. I mean, you can look at a lot of good sell sheets uh, and you can say, oh, mine's just as good or mine's better or mine's worse and then wonder why certain games get signed and certain games don't. It's because the sell sheet's not the be-all and end-all. It's literally foot-in-the-door type stuff, right? It's just like the entry. And the entry has to be compelling enough for the publisher to open the door a little bit wider, okay? And so there is definitely some confirmation bias type stuff going on here, like and name bias, recognition bias. So like if I, said Foam Lim, published... 30 games, blah, 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 go up to a publisher and say, hey, here's a sell sheet about a game. They're probably more likely to take a look at it, to be completely honest, than a sell sheet that's done by a designer who has nothing published. And that's a fact of life. But if you have the eight essential sell sheet elements, you're at least one step further to becoming published, Aha. but also to having all the information that the publisher needs to make their decision of how much further they want to go with this game and how much you know does this rise to the, the top, right? Cream rises to the top. So is your sell sheet showing that your game is the creme de la creme? So the first element is the title the logo and graphics you can see here 
that one relates to this. So this is MMA Smash. I, I'm a martial artist, so I like martial arts. Uh, demographics, you know, number of players, the time that it takes to play, the ages. Again, just a note here um, for title: do a BGG search, at least. Uh, try not to duplicate for sake of like SEO. Uh, it's it's not really necessarily a copyright or trademark thing, although it can be. More, it's just a search engine thing. Like you don't want to have the same name as somebody else and get mistaken for that game when there's like a bunch of ratings of three and five on theirs, and you want tens. Um, for the ages and player numbers, just again make sure that you are set on those that you've played them at that that you've that your game reflects those well. All right, three is a log line. Uh, log line. So I do screenwriting as well for fun, I guess. Well, you're a writer, you do lots of writing, and uh, screenwriting is one form of writing that I've tried to learn over over COVID time. So uh, for one of our role-playing games, the co my co-designer and I said, why don't we write a script for this? And so we did. Uh, and we've pitched it to Netflix and lots of other things. So we'll see where that goes. But a log line is that kind of two to three sentence, quick hit, what is this game about? Kind of brings you, draws you into the world without going expansively into the world. Uh, has a little bit about the mechanics, but not really explicitly. Again, this is just to kind of wet the person's, wet the audience's appetite for this. Put them in the context, in the frame of mind that we are going to be talking about punching and kicking and hitting people and beating them up and throwing submissions on them. Because that's what we're going to do. So here it goes. Step into the ring and test your might against the best fighters in the world. The fighter who can predict their opponent's move can take advantage of powerful combos. So we already know, okay, we're fighting. It's like uh, two players. Um, there's going to be some, you know, brain getting, in, getting into each other's heads, prediction. And there's going to be some kind of combo move set. Uh, finish the fight with a vicious knockout strike or slick submission. Oh, okay, cool. So now we know it's not just like stand-up boxing or you know, karate, there's also going to be ground fighting, which we should know if we know what MMA is, but not everybody does. So there's going to be submissions on the ground. Uh, the next part is the pitch. And the pitch is really more of, of a very, uh, like explaining what the game is like in terms of gameplay, uh, in terms of mechanisms. But again, see, it's very brief. It just says, uh, MMA Spash is a rock, paper, scissors on is rock, paper, scissors on steroid. Since a player's choice is weighted towards moves that lead to their character specific combos, you can predict what your opponent might do based on the combo cards they have access to. The stand up and grappling actions, each having their own distinct properties, uh, each have their making the head game different depending on where the fight is taking place. So we're not using a lot of buzzwords. We're talking about uh, what makes this game stand out. It's going to be that prediction and also that there's stand-up fighting versus ground fighting. Again, if you don't understand martial arts, that's okay. <laughs> this is fine. Um, number five. Okay, so we have annotated images and a gameplay description. So if you can see here, I'm using pictures of the cards that are played against, this is what Alexa is playing versus Blaze. On a turn, these are what their cards are doing. A turn two, these are the cards that have played. And then over here in the play-by-play -play section, which is the gameplay description, I've basically gone through a very detailed description of what is happening turn by turn. And I'm going to read out a couple uh, lines here, not the whole thing. Right, like Blaze starts turn two in top position on the ground. Blaze decides to risk it and try to land a quick submission. At the same time, Alexa plays reverse position. She's gotten in Blaze's head and was able to protect her move, exclamation point. Right, so here I'm telling the story of what's happening here in pictures. And I'm giving that feeling, that rush of adrenaline that you'll feel while you're making the decision. Did I pick it right? Did I pick it right? As you play and reveal, oh my gosh, this is what happens. And then there's also the mechanical stuff in here, like you deal one damage and blah, 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 and you discard this card or it locks this card out. So this stuff here uh, really does help the publisher remember, how is that game played? <laughs> if you have a sell sheet that doesn't explain how your game is played in brief, so that's, I mean, like what? two paragraphs of writing, really. It's broken out because of white space. We'll talk about that later. Um, if they can't remember from your sell sheet, it's not a good sell sheet. 
uh, now we have to talk about audience. We'll talk about that a little later, about different audiences, different needs. But particularly for a publisher, if that's where you're going, you need to tell them how the game is played. But keep it simple, keep it fluid, keep it fresh. Number seven here is the component list. And you see here, you know, cards, boards, tokens, whatever. And <clears throat> you should be putting this in full on everything. Uh, why? Because it helps the publisher get a really quick idea of what is this game going to cost? So this has like two player boards, 12 health tokens, 20 character cards, 18 action cards, two tokens. Oh, that's like a 1995 game MSRP, which means that they're probably going to sell it at $15 in the store, which means that we need to, you know, get it at an MSRP, get it at a, a landed cost of like what, you know, two to three dollars. And that's that's what that's for, right? Those component lists help with that. Uh, la, 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 la. Let's see what else there is. Uh, we'll talk about all like two, three, oh, sorry, three, four, and five. And uh, log line, the pitch, and annotation, and gameplay description. We'll talk about all of that in, in detail. So don't worry about that. We'll get there. We'll also talk about contact information in detail, too. But the contact information here is real simple. For my uh, for this one here, just like, here's our emails. That's it. But you can add more. We'll talk about the more stuff in a bit. Um, I am reading the comments. So if you do have any comments for things, do stick them up here. Uh, if you can give me a hand and put like a cue before, like a question cue and then ask the question, I can get to them as they pop up. All right, next one. Oh, I asked this question again before. Who is your intended audience? This is really important. Um, is it a publisher? Is it a distributor? Is it a vendor? Or is it the end customer? Because they all have different needs. Most customers, unless they're very savvy gamers, don't really know all the buzzwords. Uh, and you know, going to the forums on BGG isn't helpful because that is just a subset. That is a very savvy, uh, highly skilled, internet accessible <laughs> group of people. They know the words, they know the terms, but not everybody who buys game is that level of geek, right? Even if they are a board game geek. Uh, vendors and distributors, they actually care very little about the mechanisms per se. Uh, the vendors do a little bit more because they have to teach the game, but they would rather have you, you know, have you write out a teaching script for them later. And the publishers are usually who we are aiming as designers our sell sheets towards, unless we are self-publishing. If we're self-publishing, then we look at different sell sheets for distributors, vendors, and end customers because they're all different. They all have different needs. And so the publisher is the one that I focus on because I do not publish my own games. I self, uh, I don't self-publish. So that's what we're doing today. If you want to know a little bit more about distributors, vendors, and end customers, we can talk about that in the chat or in the uh, Q&A afterwards. But yeah, the intended audience for this one is publisher because um, you need to know. You need to define who your audience is. Uh, in running the pitch project, we had over 700 pitches sent in. That's a lot. <laughs> and I probably judged 50% of those myself. And the amount of people who didn't really truly understand their audience was high. Uh, they would write like they were writing for an end customer. Uh, and that's not who you need to write for. You need to write for the publisher. What does the publisher need to know? So let's talk about the big fish in the room, I guess. It's the elephant, the fish in the room. To catch a publisher, you need the right lure. And a lure is a bait plus the hook. So what do I mean by bait and hook? And why are they different? And aren't they the same thing? And the answer is not really. So you can see here, just even here on any of these lures, uh, if you're a fisher person, if you like fishing, a lure is the attracting bait plus the hook. <sighs> What's the difference? Well, let's talk, talk about that. So the bait is well, a wriggly worm, right? It's like wriggly and tasty and you know, the fish wants to eat it. 
it gets the intended audience to stop and look and maybe listen to you talk about the game, right? It is the theme, maybe components, maybe a mechanism. It could be that, right? So we've often, when I'm talking about a hook, people will bring up like, oh, the tree in Everdale. Is it really the tree in Everdale? There's a tree in Everdale bait to get you to stop and look at the table. Because it certainly is not mechanically <laughs> incorporated in the game much, right? So stop thinking about your hooks in the way that people have maybe taught you in the past. Uh, it's more bait, really. Bait is flashy, eye-catching, sensory, like the like the uh, tiles in Hanabi, uh, if you play ever played the deluxe version. That's not a hook. That's bait to get you to stop and look at the game. And um, uh, bait is immediate. It catches your interest right away. It's important. I, I'm not saying don't have bait. You need bait. To land a fish, you need bait. If you threw in a bear hook into the water, the chances of you catching something, boop, really slim. Right? Think about it. So bait is superficial and weak and short-term. That is what you need to remember. Superficial, weak, and short-term. Nobody who plays Everdale for long-term keeps playing it because of the Everdale tree. They don't. They might say, oh, I like the cute animals, and the, the theme is cool. But in the end, they wouldn't keep playing it if that was all there was. There's got to be something deeper than that. And that's where you get to the hook. Just like the bait, the hook is separate. The hook gets your intended audience to talk about your game, to think about your game. It like it sinks in them. You have you're living in their head rent free because your game is awesome. And you have to identify what that is. And so many people are good at identifying that superficial bait that they forget. Oh, maybe I need to talk about the hook. What is the hook? And in the MMA Smash one that we talked about, the hook is it you know, oh, martial arts. The hook is getting in each other's heads and the difference between, you know, position A and position B changing the game. That's the hook. And that's what people talk about after they play the game. It's like, oh my gosh, I did all that head game. It was really awesome. And oh, wow, you know, the, the difference between being on your back and fighting on the back versus stand-up fighting was really well done. And that's really implemented well. And they'll talk about it, and they'll think about it, and that meta strategy that they're forming in their head about playing the game. By the way, uh, that is also what I use to determine whether a game is done, is when people start talking and thinking about the game after the game. And I don't mean saying, oh, I'd buy that. I mean strategy. I mean, like, they're saying, oh, you know, next time I'm going to try this, or next time I want this card and that card. I won't buy this one anymore because I think that's a better way for my play style. So finding the hook in your game is really, really difficult, but it is, it is super, super important that you do. <laughs> um, hooks are experiential. Hooks, you have to experience the hook in order to get caught by it. Like, really, you have to experience it. So, I mean, think about it. Who's your favorite band? If you just saw the name of the band, saw a picture of the band, and saw the, the, the title of their song, you would say, oh my God, best band ever. I'm going to buy all their music and follow them around in a bus on tour, right? You saw Grateful Dead and you know it's a bunch of you know hippies with beards and you know one of the names of their songs. I'm not a deadhead, so I don't know the names of their songs, but let's say there was one. Um, I wouldn't follow them around, but if I listened to that music, if I experienced the message that they're trying to get across in the music, bam, I am hooked, right? Hooks are emotional. Hooks have that resonance. I'll talk about resonance a lot. Resonance is a word I use all the time uh, when I talk about games. Uh, if you're ever talking to Sarah Ship, uh, she talks about resonance a lot as well. I don't know if we use it exactly the same, and we'll probably come to blows about that at some day because Sarah and I are we like words a lot. Uh, and so experiences that are emotional. And they need to sink in. They need time. They need a little time and exposure to sink in. Bait is immediate and instant. It's like, I look at that, I see, oh, I get it. But tell you, if I look at it and see it and I get it, it's not a deep hook, right? Not necessarily. Some of them can be, but most of them aren't. Hooks are deep and strong. They're like, 
in you and they're pulling at you, right? And they make you want to come back to the table to play that game. So Everdale is a great example of this because it has both a bait and a hook. Everdale uh, is a really good game. It could be themed anything else and it'd still be a good game, right? That hook, that hook of the experience of Everdale is still there. But it has also good bait because it looks cool. Has that big ass tree. That's great. And you need both in today's day and age. Uh, we often call bait, um, and sometimes hooks, differentiators. Like what differentiates your game from another game on the table? Why should I play this versus the other thing? One really good thing, because uh, I work in mass market as well, is uh, Mike Gray and Tanya Thompson, uh, who are, well, Mike is retired, but they used to be uh, inventor relations for Hasbro, and, ha and Tanya still is. And they always ask me when I pitch to them, it's like, Sen, what do you think a commercial for that would look like? Uh, or what do you think an ad for that would look like? Or what do you think, you know, because it's true, are people just going to take a picture of it and and or a video of it and virally post that without you telling them to? Some of that is bait, but some of that is hook, right? And how you advertise it, how is this game going to be sold to the next level of audience is an important thing to think about as well. Now, hobby gaming is a little bit different because we have people who will just, you know, buy based on a type of game because they oh i like deck builders let's try this new deck builder out i've heard good things about this one but again remember not everybody is that savvy and you might want to get out of hobby or branch out or you stay some in the hobby but also go into mass market because let me tell you that is where the money is um so the difference between bait and hook very very important for you to understand that and that comes to this like do we need bait do we need a hook the answer is, oh, this is slower than I wanted it to be. There you go. Why don't we have both? Yay. That is the entire thing. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> that was more for me than for you. I just love that meme. She's a cute little girl. And I think both is often uh, the way that we need to think about things. Uh, the world isn't as binary as people make it out. Uh, there is a spectrum of many experiences, and you can have both bait and hook. In fact, you do need both. So let's talk about this. This is very important. This is, I keep saying that. <laughs> I keep saying that this is very important because it's all real important to me. Um, developing an experience first log line or an elevator pitch. All right, so I made this Mad Lib like two or three years ago and people have been using it since then and they like it. Um, note that it's not perfect. Like nothing I make is ever perfect. That is the law of Sen. Um, it's just put in a format that captures as much information as possible and it's going to feel awkward. I guarantee it will feel like silly and awkward as you say it, but you'll find your own voice. You'll find your own way. This is just ensuring you have the critical information in order to write, write that elevator pitch, write those log lines. Okay, so let's say here, uh, I developed a game called WWE um, Headlock Paper Scissors. Uh, and so I'm going to try. I've never done this one for this one because I didn't have to pitch it. It was based on something else, a pre-existing uh, game that we made for WizKids. And then they said, hey, do you want to make a WWE one? We said, yes, of course we do because I am a wrestling nerd. So yeah, in WWE Headlock Paper Scissors, you play as a WWE superstar in the uh, Money in the Bank wrestling match trying to defeat other players and get that suitcase so in money in the bank if you have never watched wrestling there's a ladder that you have to climb onto and you have to grab a big briefcase that is filled with actually a contract and money and stuff i think right the coolest thing about wwe headlock paper scissors is when okay so the core mechanism is that's what i would describe when you throw hand signs at each other and because that's rock paper wizards was what it was based on and so it's headlock paper scissors you're throwing hand signs um, and the hook would be, and you execute your moves as that wrestler, the character that you're playing, um, because that's the experience we want to sell to people. 
right? The hook. The experience I'm trying to sell to you is you can play like that wrestler. That wrestler, I have all, you know, I have their power moves on there. I have their pictures on there. They all are asymmetrical because not every wrestler is the same. That kind of thing. And when that happens, you feel like you just pile drive a brother, right? That kind of thing. And so you can do that for your game. And it's going to sound silly. I, I guarantee you, you're not going to like it. But the problem, not the problem, but the process is that you get to refine it as you go on. So let's move on from that. Uh, if you want this, I can copy and paste it somewhere. Maybe I'll get it out to Mike and Grace and they can put it in the in the Discord. That's where they can put it. So yeah, game name, role. So I want to know who you are in the game, where you are in the game, what you're doing in the game. What is the core mechanism? But what does that make you feel? What does that make you feel? What's the best, most absolute best feeling in that game? That's what I want, right? As a publisher, that's what you're trying to sell. Uh, I truly believe that games are curated experiences inside a box. Well, board games, right? That's all that they are. And we'll talk about uh, replicability in a bit, but that's really what I'm aiming at here. So when you try to make your pitch perfect, you want to give your audience the context, answer the five whys. You don't have to answer them all at once. You don't have to answer them in the same sentence. Just across your pitch, you should probably take a look at who, what, when, where, how, why. When is not as important, but the other ones are pretty important. Who are you? What are you doing? Where is this happening? You know, and how do you do it? How do you feel? Right? Five W's. Boom. Done. Tell your audience how to play the game and win, but use very brief, broad terms. I don't want you talking with buzzwords. I'll talk about that later. I don't want you getting into the nitty gritty of it yet. In your elevator pitch, it's really just you like throw hand signs to activate your superpower, your wrestling moves. Boom. That's it. They don't need to more know more yet. You want to you want to give them enough to go on, but you want them to ask questions. It's actually really important. So this is where my you know role as a psychology prof comes up. It's a tease. You want them to ask you questions so that they go, like if they look at your sell sheet, they go, oh yeah, I get it all. Nope, don't want it. That was a really necessarily a great sell sheet. Uh, your sell sheet should entice them to engage with you. Remember, game design, hobby gaming is super relational based, super, 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 super. And you want to get in these dialogues. In fact, sometimes you don't care if this game signs. I just want to talk to that publisher so I can establish a relationship with them so that when time comes that I have something that I know fits them so perfectly, I've got an open door policy. So there's another purpose, right? It's just to engage in dialogue. Uh, that's the leave the wanting more, right? You can leave some things to the imagination. You don't have to spell out everything. There's times when you do like component lists, right? Spell that out. Uh, your contact information, if you just say, send Fuglum at question mark, <laughs> they're going to guess, I think it's going to be Gmail. I think it should be Gmail. <laughs> no, you got to tell them that entirely. But like things like, Specifics like how do you throw hand signs? What hand signs? Doesn't matter. You might say one or two of them, but you don't have to show them the whole gamut. You don't have room. When you are practicing your pitch, say it out loud. Speaking it can be very different than writing it and reading it. Time it. You only have about 30 seconds. That's really all you want anyway, because that is impactful. Right? From the behavior to the feedback for that behavior, 30 seconds is what we're looking for. I tell you it, you absorb it, you tell me if you want to know more. Boom, that's it. So uh, I'll just tell you a story about how we do it. We have like maybe 5, 10, 15, depends on how many games we're pitching, sell sheets lined up. And I'll literally just go through the log lines and say, okay, this is a game about this. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Interested or not? They say, no, I put it in the no pile. The next one, I read it out. They say, oh, yeah, that sounds good. Put that in, interesting, put that in the interested pile. And I do that for all of them. I don't go through any of the sell sheets. I just read the log lines out. And then once I get the interested pile, then we'll go through them in a little more detail. 
And I'll say, okay, this was a co-op. Did you want a co-op? This one's a two-player only. Are you okay with that? And then we'll whittle it down to like the two, three sell sheets they really want. I don't waste anybody's time. Cardinal sin of game design, of pitching, is wasting people's time. Do not do it. You will not be their friend. People have so little time, especially at live conventions. Can't waste it. You just can't waste it. Oh, very good question. Ed20 is asking, can it? Can you send unsolicited sell sheets to publishers or should we query first? Never, ever, 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 ever send unsolicited things to anybody. It's a law. Do not do that. Like, Not that it's illegal, but it's a law of game design. So here's why. I'll tell you. It is legal why you shouldn't. is because they publishers will just throw them away. And there's a reason why. Because if they have something in development already and they looked at your thing, now they're on the hook. They've just exposed themselves to litigation. Nobody likes litigation. Right? And who's to who can prove that? They can, most likely. Like, I have seven months of development on this game that was pitched to me a year ago by this person who developed it three years ago, and they have records of that. But do you want to go through the law? Do you want to go through lawyers to do that? Not really, no. So they'll just pitch your stuff. Like, They'll pitch your pitch. They'll pitch it to the garbage can. Do not send prototypes unsolicited. To, they will not get sent back to you. Right? It, it's, it is something that is I view as completely unprofessional. Just don't do it. Ask. Hey, I have a game. Give them the log line. That's what a log line's for. Hey, a game about martial arts, blah, 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 blah. Was wondering if you'd be interested. Can I send you a sell sheet? They'll say yes or no. They'll say, yeah, please do. Or they'll say, no, you know what? I've got enough of those types of games. Or no, uh, I don't have enough bandwidth. Or, you know, you can, but, you know, we're already into 2023 with our lineup or whatever. So please do. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just query. It's exactly the same uh, as screenwriting. Like, you just don't send unsolicited stuff anywhere. Uh, it's very legal, lit litigious, uh, or can become litigious because of stuff like what I'm talking about. Uh, also, again, you want to establish a dialogue. I actually, with publishers, I know, like I, I know publishers like for years and years and years. We're like friends. We talk on the daily on the internet type stuff. Um, but I'll still ask them, hey, do you want me to send that to you? And they'll say, sure. And I'll send it to them. And I'll ask them a question, right? Because I want to keep that dialogue going, right? And this is not evil psych prof talk. This is just, you need to do that. You need to keep this ongoing conversation, right? Because as soon as it leaves their brain, it leaves their brain for good until they think about it again. So you might poke them about it. But what happens if you had this ongoing daily dialogue? Isn't that better? Cool. Oh, something happened. It went the wrong way. Um, boop. So yeah, rehearse your pitch. Ask your mom, your friends, your dog. Uh, and again, Ed 20 games, if you're a screenwriter, you know this. Stuff sounds different when you say it than when you read it than when you actually, you know, rehearse it. Record it. You got phones that record. You got computers that record. Hear what it sounds like. See what you look like when you're pitching. It's really important. You don't have that derp face going on, right? Uh, combine your ver verbal pitch with visuals. So that's what we do. So our sell sheets, you'll note later, I'll show you that we actually use them to teach the game before we ever put the game on the table. And you want to sell your experience. Don't focus on the theme or the mechanism. Sell the overall experience, okay? Don'ts for pitching. Uh, don't explain your artistic intent. Your artistic intent. Uh, nobody cares. Like literally, nobody cares. Sorry to tell you. <laughs> they just don't. Not until they sign your game. Then they care enough to say, hey, can you write a designer diary? Oh, can we get your bio from you? Until then, they really could care less. They just want to know, is this a good game? Is this a game that is for their company? Uh, similarly, don't describe the game's world or lore in detail. Again, nobody cares. Yet. Like if you read a treatise on, you know, some game, some world from a game without seeing what the game looked like. Would you care? Probably not. Probably not, because it probably just feels generic and, oh, it's generic high fantasy, or it's, oh, it's generic post-apocalypse, generic space sci-fi thing. There's not enough reason to care yet. Give them a reason. That reason is the experience that you're providing. Uh, don't use negative comparisons to other games. This can totally backfire. I've had people tell me that, oh yeah, I was pitching a game to a company. I said, it's better than X. And they're like, yeah, that's my game. I made that game. Uh, 
right? So don't do that. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't compare your games to other games. A game from screenwriting, there's a pitch style called the Hollywood pitch where it's like, it's like speed, but on a boat. <laughs> speed was on a bus, the original one. I can't remember. It was I think speed two might've been on a boat. Um, so you can do that. It's not necessarily the greatest way to do it though. I think there's more that you could do with selling your experience. Also, um, games are different than movies. Movie experiences can be like hashed and rehashed and rehashed again. Game experiences are like, you own that, it's on your table, it's in a box. Maybe I don't need that same experience again. Tell me what's really different about yours. Try not to use uh, industry jargon and hyperbole. Plain speak works the best. So, oh, you know, it's a deck builder, asymmetrical, blah, 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 blah. If I can't use those words to, to sell my game to a general person on the street or in a con, don't use it on your sell sheets either. Yes, they are shortcuts, but I don't use the word but a lot in my language, but <laughs> they are shortcuts. However, they may be less of a shortcut than you think. Um, it's better just to explain it in plain English or whatever language you're using. And hyperbole, uh, this is the best game ever. This is, you know, those are unsubstantiated claims that you really cannot back up and they make everybody give you the side eye, right? Um, again, don't explain how your mechanisms work as much as how you explain why they're cool. Right, again, that experience is what matters. You can talk a little bit, you know, and then they lose one life point. Oh my God, they're much closer to death. You know, go for the experience, go for the the, the gusto on those ones. Okay. Um, we'll talk about that later. And twenty, save that for later. Okay. A picture says a thousand words. It really does. We want to show. And uh, this is from a game called Acrotiri. And these are just like our prototype pictures. These are not like anything awesome at all, but that's actually important. It shows the publishers that, oh, a physical prototype exists. And we tell a story through the in-game images. I don't use product shots ever, like just like layout of cards in a box. That doesn't tell a story. I want to tell the story of the game. You can use physical assets, you can use digital assets. A lot of people right now are building their games in Tabletop Simulator because of the virus, and so they are then taking screenshots and using those, and it's beautiful, it's wonderful. Uh, professional professional illustrations. I don't know why I have an LY at the end of that. Not needed. You don't need to show professional stuff. It just has to be recognizable. Good enough, right? Uh, you can use sequentially numbered images to show the game flow. So I would rather see like three pictures of how a game is flowing from state to state than a product shot. You know, beautifully laid out product shot. That tells me nothing about the game or how it's played or what the experience is like. Uh, and so we want to show and tell. Tell, we want to annotate our images, explain what's happening in words. Look, the blue player think he's found a temple using this map. And then he does all these things at the bottom there. I use callouts to point to things so I can point to them when I'm talking to the the publisher at the table say, hey, this is how this works. See how he used this and he thinks he's found this temple. So he finds two on this side, two on that side, one on that side. Boom, this is where the temple is. So I point to key items in the picture. And uh, I didn't do this very well, but you can do better than I can. This is to help you improve as well. Use gender neutral terms or a diverse cast of players um, when you are naming people or gendering people in your examples. It's really important. Doesn't seem like it is, but it is. Um, so pictures do say a thousand words, but what can't they describe? There's two things. They can't describe player agency and they can't describe player experience. So you're going to have to do that with words. So what are the players doing? How are they doing it? How are the players in control of the resulting experience? <gasps> this is fabulous stuff. <laughs> this is high level stuff, guys. Um, so, and, and uh, any women out there as well, this is, this is important stuff. Um, when we're talking about player control, player agency of the resulting experience, what I mean is this, does the game facilitate an experience in a reliably repeatable manner? Is it reliable? Can I do it again and again? If I get the right cards, if I play well, 
Why is that particularly important? Well, agency is important. People don't just like rolling dice and random things happening. That's part of it. But also because you want, again, a consistent experience every time I open that box. It doesn't mean I'm always going to be the one that wins. It just means that I know how this game is going to play. Consistency is great because that means this experience every time it comes to the box is going to be similar. What, what is the person playing the game feeling? Why are they feeling this way? How does your game help them to feel this way? How does it push them in these directions for experiences? Those are super important. So you may not like Munchkin, but Munchkin does this. That's why it sells so well. Munchkin facilitates a consistent experience. Whether you like it or not, it does it. So uh, last couple slides here. Keep in contact. So mandatory, uh, name of the designers, primary contacts, email, phone, mailing address. But really only put the phone if you respond to voice messages. I know lots of people don't these days. Uh, only put your mailing, mailing address if you expect your physical prototype to be returned. Um, you should be careful with who you give your information to. So just remember those there's reasons why you might not want some of those things on there. Other suggestions for contact information are your website, social media links, online resources. So if there's rules, if there's play, print and play files, if there's a how to play video, you can put those links up there. And you might put awards on there like, you know, project pitch project finalist 2020, BGDL finalist, proto spiel tested, tabletop mentorship member. You know, those things might matter to some people. Okay. So some quick tips and tricks before we move into our Q&A. Last minute words of wisdom. So avoid walls of text. Too much text, no bueno. Uh, avoid a lack of white space. So put space in between everything that you can. In fact, less is more, really. That's a good kind of heuristic to follow. Avoid poorly lit photos. So get like a $20 ring light. Use it. It's helpful. Or natural lighting, even better. Thematic but unreadable fonts are not great, right? You want people to understand the information you're trying to convey them. So uh, use two fonts at the most. Use a title font that is thematic, but still fairly readable. Like you have some fancy like font with all these wingdings on it for like fantasy battle world. That's the name of your game. Fantasy Battle World. It has these like oh frilly, filigree all over this stuff. Makes it look fantastical. But then when you're writing about, you know, this battle takes place on the world of Endora, blah, 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 blah. Don't put that in the thematic font. Just write it in a very simple font. Whether it's serif, sans serif, doesn't really matter. It's just a simple font. You can see that. Even here on this style, I have this kind of weird little font here for the titles. And then I have this very standard kind of almost like courier level font for the text, the readable text. Make sense? Um, try to also avoid using quotes from your playtesters because bottom line, nobody cares, really. Uh, unless your playtester play was Matt Leacock or, you know, Isaac Childress or Vladis Shvato, they don't care. And even then, is it really something you care about? You don't necessarily need to put key selling features on there either. These are just try to avoid. If you have nothing else to put there, I guess. But there are so many better things to put there than alternative themes. So alternative themes are problematic because people just want to know what is the best game you made with this. You could talk about alternative themes all day long, but you don't need, or like tie-ins, like Ed 20 is asking about, you know, uh, IP tie-ins, but you don't have to do that on your sell sheet. With key selling features and alternative themes, here's a trick. This is psychology. <laughs> People don't like being told what their area of expertise is, right? People don't like being told what they should already know or be able to sense. You should be able to tell them without using words, using your sell sheet that, oh, this is a game that the key selling features are, it's a small package, it's dice-based, it's you know going to cost under 20 bucks, uh, and it has you know really cool, a really cool game loop. They should know that already. You don't have to tell them. Really cool game loop. Why waste that space? Uh, put your best, best foot forward and be decisive. So this goes with the alternate themes and expansions and all that kind of stuff. They don't need to go on your sell sheet. Just tell them this is the game. 
once you add all these other variables and options in it, uh, that's not necessarily the best. You can create dialogue. You can say, oh, I have also ideas for future expansions or you know, IP tie-ins and all that kind of stuff, but we don't need to write that down on the sell sheet itself. It's something that people in the industry, like publishers in the industry, if they're worth their salt, will already know and ask you, right? Cool. Yeah, let's get some questions going. We are almost done. Um, so, oops. Ah, no, something weird happened. <laughs> Sorry, one sec. There it is. You can find me on the internet in these places on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and the webpage. Uh, so, yeah, please do get at me if you need anything. I'm really helpful. <laughs> really, uh, I like helping people. So, uh, I don't mind questions um, if you can deal with getting the answers maybe later than you want them. But I, I, I'm a teacher. So, uh, my students email me any time of day and they will likely get an answer within five minutes because it's attached to my hip. Now my phone, it goes to my phone. So if you reach out to me, I will likely help you. I can't promise that it'll be immediate, but I will give you whatever help I can. And I will also, uh, you know, pass you on to people who might know more than I do if I don't know the answer to the question, right? Cool. So uh, back to N20 question and N20 games question. Do you think it pays to have a franchise hook in the pitch? For example, uh, mentioning how expandable it is. It is. Uh, so again, like I said, I think that publishers are smart. Publishers like to think they're smart as well, like to think that. So they would like to come up with that. Uh, you can subtly kind of uh, talk about it. But again, I wouldn't waste space on that. That's a product, not an experience you need to sell an experience to the publisher. Your publisher then sells the product to distribution stores and customers. Now, logic would say, what if I made it clearer that is it is a product or it can be a product? Well, and you have to do, you do have to start thinking of games as products if you are gonna take this pro. But still, these are things that are a little bit beyond the scope of sell sheets in my opinion. All right. So awesome. That's it for the presentation. Let's go to the stuff that's outside of here. Yeah. <laughs> that was fantastic, Sen. Thank you so much. No problem. Um, yeah, absolutely. I took a couple of just like real quick stuff, which I uh my takeaways um were that sell sheets are only part of the pitch, you know. Uh you can yeah. only make them so good, but they're not gonna sell your game for you, right? No, and there's other tools. Like a lot of people want sizzle reels now. Um, you know, obviously you can live pitch in TTS just as well. Oh, well, not just as well, but almost, right. almost as well as you can pitch live at a convention. So there's a lot of barriers that are coming down. We're going to see some changes. I do have thoughts about TTS in general, but that's not it's not for here. It's for later. <laughs> Next time. You can ask me later. <laughs> there you go. Well, speaking of asking you things, uh, we've got another question here. Uh, N20 Games again wants to know, uh, do you feel like board gaming has trends to watch? Oh, good. Uh, so, yes, but no. There are definitely trends. There's obvious trends. But if you're watching them, you're late. Uh, and that mm -hmm. deals with the life cycle of games and production cycles of games. So from from pitch to publication, you're looking anywhere from like a year to two to three years of development time and marketing time and all those things. So whatever you think is a trend now, because you see a lot of people publishing it, it's not going to be a trend by the time that your game gets picked up. Mm -hmm. So I, I would avoid following the trends or building to a trend specifically, unless you are a self publisher that can get it out, you know, now and fund it now on Kickstarter and have it, be in hands in a year that you can do if you want to do that but if you're pitching to publishers they they're already looking past zombies and you know aliens or whatever's hot this year which is you know i can tell you what's hot <laughs> but uh they're 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 going to be looking past that particularly so yeah. that doesn't mean don't look at trends it means don't rely on trends to get you any particular leverage or footage in the game industry that's great Peter has a question. Yeah, Peter's question here. So when pitching in person, at what point do you give the publisher your sell sheet? I give the publishers the sell sheet when they want it. <laughs> <I don't, laughs> no, seriously. It's like, 
um, like I said, I go through my book of sell sheets mm -hmm. and I say, hey, which ones are interesting? We break them into interesting, not interesting. And then from there, uh, you know, we might play what are two of the interesting ones. And then I'll say, okay, so which, which do you want any of these prototypes to take with you? Do you want any of these sell sheets to take with you? And oftentimes I'll go, oh, I'll take those two sell sheets. Oh, and you know what? Give me that one too. I didn't get to see it, but something about it. There's something about it. And they'll take it. And sometimes something comes of it. Something, nothing comes of it. But it's a piece of paper, so give it. Uh, but yeah, it's again that that idea. Like I would rather people ask for my stuff than me force it on them. Because when they ask for it, at least I know that they want it. They have intentions with it. It's like if I, you know, <laughs> you know those old timey movies. Like, what are your intentions with my daughter? Right. These are my daughters, <laughs> and I want to know that uh, the publishers have some intention to use them. Otherwise, I'll just, you know, I'll give that sell sheet to somebody else who does, or you know, the prototype as well. It's like, if you don't have real intentions to look at this within the next like three months, two months, I have somebody who does have mm -hmm. intentions to do that so i'm gonna give it to them so there's all that sort of negotiation stuff that happens after the pitch but yeah cool uh jason brisson wants you to get out your crystal ball here uh first oh, yeah. incredible workshop sen uh will the pitching landscape uh return to an in-person convention focus or do you think we're in a new world of virtual pitching uh where that's going to be maybe just as you know viable yeah. as a person Q, why not both GIF? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what will happen. It's why not both. Uh, so there are, I already talked about my grievances with TTS. There are many. Uh, TTS multiplies the gameplay time by at, by at least a, a quarter, if not a third. Uh, it is, it is for certain games, it is super unergonomic. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I don't even know that's a word, non-ergonomic, uh, and it's it's not great uh, for certain types of games. Like so, like there's you can there is a gravity and physical engine in it, but I would never pitch a dexterity game in that. Mm -hmm. um, games where you know you rely on social cues, I wouldn't play that there. Uh, games where it's like tons and tons of chits and cards and things, <clears throat> unless I fully automated it. Uh, I wouldn't want to pitch that in there. I would still do that. But so, yeah, I, I think in person pitching is going to be still a thing. Uh, but what it has done is it's made a lot of publishers open to the idea of virtual pitching, mm -hmm. which leads to hopefully untapped sources from around the world that can't make it to cons uh, in Europe or America uh, that you know, have the technology to do that. So it's definitely, I think, opening up the market to new people. Uh, one word of warning is like, you, you need to understand the physical constraints of board games before you start making your game in tabletop because there's some things you can do in tabletop that you can't replicate in cardboard. You just can't. You can't yeah. do that. Or can't include that many tokens. Or, you know, there's no way any publisher is going to allow you to have a game with like 64 custom dice. <laughs> right not gonna happen but you can't <laughs> entirely make that game in tabletop simulator and let it live there that's fine absolutely cool um so uh before oh actually this is related to tabletop all right we'll do this question and then we've actually got a bunch of sell sheets in sure. the Discord. let's go so take a look at we'll them. pop over to that in a second yeah. uh but first n20 games wants to know uh do you think it helps to have a game prototype up on tabletop simulator for publishers to check out 100 percent. yeah 100 yeah right now for sure uh, like James Hudson from uh, Druid City Games and Skybound. Uh, by the way, go watch uh, Invincible on Prime. Very good cartoon. Uh, it's a Skybound cartoon I image. Um, he said, like, he hated Tabletop Simulator before this, but then I was like, yeah, it's part of our workflow. I don't know if we'll ever go back to not using it. I doubt it. Um, you know, will he receive pitches on it? I don't know, but he at least likes it now before mm -hmm. he hated it. Uh, and so I think part of it is that we do with what we must, you know, we deal with it because we can't get out into conventions. But I think there is a utility to having things like TTS for testing as well. Um, mm -hmm. Tabletopia is a little bit better for testing because people don't have to buy Tabletop Simulator. But right now, if there's a publisher out there that doesn't have Tabletop Simulator, I'd be asking you, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Right? How are you how are you keeping up with publishing? Publishing is often a publisher parish position, like literally, like you have to publish or you're done. Mm 
Mm -hmm. uh, because you fall out of the market in terms of like the mind space. Um, so a lot of people are publish or perish in terms of like generating SKUs, like numbers for their games uh, and having stuff product to constantly bring yourself to the top of distributors' minds so that they'll sell all your products. So um, if you're not using TTS as a publisher, that's weird. If you're not using TTS as a designer, I can see that though, because a lot of people are like, I don't make those kind of games. I don't make a game that's suitable for that. I don't know how to make a game in that. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. Sit out for a year or two. That's fine. People are still, like if you mailed somebody a prototype, they'd still take it probably as long as they could like douse it in Purell. <laughs> right, right. Uh, you know, I think it's still an option. <laughs> awesome. Uh, cool. All right. So I'm going to share uh, some screens here. We've got uh, some people in the Discord who are posting their sell sheet. Uh, and this first one here is going to be from uh, Courtney Shernan. Uh, let me share this up. I've got it up in my cool. internet here. If I don't look at, like I'm looking at the camera, it's because I'm moving this screen to one of my giant screens so I can read the Discord better. There so. it is, Chrome. I, I, I am still there. You're there. <laughs> I'm going to look over there, though. Okay. Uh, cool. All right. Can you see this? I'll scroll as well. Yeah. Okay. Treat, please. Got it. Yeah. So we've got a tabletop sim screenshot there. Yep. Cool. I'll stop right before your contact information, Courtney. <laughs> Yeah, that's smart. Good. So uh, components are great. Um, I like just even like these simple graphics are good uh, just to convey like it's, you know, dogs in a neighborhood, um, not like wild pack animals, right? <laughs> uh, see these things here like lead mechanics with hand building resource management set collection. It's not necessarily needed, but it's also not taking up a lot of room. So when I say don't do some things, it's more just because there's other things you need to say. Uh, so here's your lead line. That's good. Your log line, sorry. Um, and then on your turn, good. So a turn by turn visual description is excellent, right? So this is what I'm doing. Here's how it works, blah, blah, blah. Uh, choose, choose your behavior wisely and you're sure to become the most spoiled doggo. Good. So I would say just try to um, tell a little more story in the turns, in terms of like, why do you want to do that? What experience is that? What's the best experience that happens in this game? Like, when do people playing this game go, oh my God, this is amazing. Oh, look at that. They did this thing to me. Or, or like, when something happens, they go, oh my gosh, and they all throw up their hands. That's what you want to talk about in your game. Um, so on the, in the WWE game, like I was talking about, one of the best things that happens when two people make the same hand side is, hand sign they're aimed at each other mm -hmm. uh it's it's chaos random stuff happens and people love it because it's just hilarious uh they intended to do one thing but these totally different outcomes happen just like in wrestling right so it's fun um with the the tts shot that's that's okay so it shows people that i have this in tts that's like an indicator uh that you have a tts mod going which is fine uh i would try to use that picture to teach Although you have a really nice section here of the on your turn. I think that does that better than this TTS thing does. Uh, but what you could do with this is just even title it, you know, mod available on TTS or, you know, uh, contact me to play a game over TTS or something like that. Just to ensure that people know that it's it's a working thing. That might not be too bad. Um, and then your, your content's at the bottom, et cetera, et cetera. I think, yeah, everything else is pretty okay. Hey, 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 don't show her name. <laughs> uh, yeah. So in terms of production, uh, can you scroll down just a little bit so I can see the just the contents yeah. components? So 121 uh, poker size cards is a little bit outside of what I would necessarily recommend. If you need that to make the best game possible, great. If there's any way to get it down to uh, like 108, that would be for most most manufacturers two sheets, um, and it just makes it a little bit cheaper to make. Uh, that is because she every she, every publisher or sorry every manufacturer has a different cut size for their sheets, 
it depends what kind of substrate they're using to cut their cards on. And most poker slash bridge cards are about anywhere from 54 to 60 cards per sheet. Uh, and so you might want to think about how do I get that down to that number? But if this is the best game that you have and it is exactly 121 cards, that's okay too. Cool. Yeah, that's awesome. not a bad job at all, Courtney. Good job. All right, perfect. Uh, yeah, just tell more stories. Yeah. Uh, we'll see. We're going to move on to uh, Fernando's sell sheet here. Uh, All right. This is for a game. uh, Rapunzel's pizza party. Okay, cool. (laughs) That title already has me, has me going right. And there's your, 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 you know, your log line connect break cards to deliver each princess, her favorite slice of pizza. One to four, 15 minutes, five to eight players. Oh, that's ages five to eight. Okay. Oh, yeah. One to four players. Got it. Rapunzel and her braided princess friends defeat an evil... So even just this, uh, like breaking words across lines, is you can you can just move friends over there, put defeated on the next line. Uh, I would not break text across lines. It becomes confusing when you're trying to process that fast. So it's, that's called reading fluency, and we want to make sure that reading fluency is high on cell sheets. Um, now they're throwing a pizza party in the top. Build four card tall braids. Oh, I see. Okay. So the braids are four cards in length. Okay. Um, for each princess before their deliveries arrive to have an awesome party. Okay. So we have, this is what these people want. These princesses want these particular things, you know, um, cheese pizza and headphones apparently um keep it on the delivery track to see what will come next deliver the pizza while hot to earn more points okay that's interesting so you have your annotation here i like the way that you've used the white outline to show that something's you know working that's good um card so Again, the only thing that's kind of missing here is the experience. It's all very mechanical. Uh, tie in some more emotion into the wording, uh, and I think things will be will be helpful. Because I, I get it. I get all of this just from the cards on this and what you're putting here and uh, how this works. So things slide over. As they get closer to the tower, they get delivered. And when they can make their way up all the way to somebody's hair up the braid then they then you score right um so that's cool and there's a couple things i'm not understanding like how do these cards change and uh, does this always just exist now that's a straight path all the time for cheese pizza i don't know uh so yeah a little more story a little more emotion um you could probably get rid of all these stars like clever and puzzling playing ahead skills tactile feedback um because like tactile feedback is a huge buzzword. And really, if you just got cards and chits, do you really have tactile feedback or do you got cards and chits? Like when we say tactile feedback, uh, we're meaning like something like bigger than standard components, like um, mousetrap has you know mechanical and tactile feedback because you're making a physical mousetrap. This is cards and chits. It's not the same. Um, and while, yes, clever and puzzling and playing ahead skills are great, why do you call that out in the story somewhere? Like, instead of move a card, draw, personalize it, say, you know, uh, player A, but instead of player A, you know, make it like a name, like like, like Judy move, places a card here, you know, blah, 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 blah. Isn't she clever? <laughs> right? Write that in there. Take your points, write them into the flow, make a narrative, make a story out of it. Uh, yes, it's important to break things out in points sometimes, but sometimes it makes more sense to work it into the wording. That's what I do on this one. Awesome. Oh, that's fantastic. And, and Courtney is posting there that uh, they really appreciate your uh, your feedback. Anytime. Uh, yeah. All right. I think we got one more. Uh, cool. and this, yeah. Uh, this one is going to be... i to make sure I pick up the right one here. Um where is it? There it is. Uh, this is a persuasion, uh, and um, 
This is from Katie Allred. Uh, she posted in the uh, Discord that she's already thinking of making changes to this based on your uh, uh, based on your talk. Uh, and I'll just mention cool. that white box was just I took out their contact. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Cool. So let's see here. We've got Persuasion, the Victorian card chip card game. Some icons, a picture. Eight minutes per player, three to eight players, ages 13 plus. Court your friends while trying to deduce who is compatible with you in this quasi cooperative game. Multiple players can win by finding this right or independence. I like that. That's great. Um, so, yeah. Um, things that you have to explain right away from the lead may be difficult, like quasi cooperative. Well, what does that really mean? Uh, there might be a better way of saying that. Um, all your card examples down here because they're splayed, I don't know how to play the game. Like I just, I don't, cause I can't read the cards enough to understand. I would, I would want a turn, like a round of play shown. Like this how to court is, is probably good in that, but I want to see it described visually as well. Remember again, pictures say a thousand words. Of course you need words to help you say all those things, but you could actually take this, all the space that you're using for the cards at the bottom, uh, the space that you're using for how to court, the space that you're using for the demographics and what's to love, uh, and even the picture at the top. That's like one, two, three, four, five, six, 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 um, probably four, six, six, six. That's probably like a whole bunch of square inches. <laughs> I can't calculate it. Like 24 <laughs> square inches, roughly, probably, that you could fill with an example of, of card play which is really, really interesting uh, because I want to know more about how do I find independence and what's the difference between independence and finding the right match for my character. Uh, and because this reads very much like a story type of game, like where you're invested in your characters and stuff, I want to know more about that. Like I, I, think, I think some emotionality would be good and that's probably the what's to love. But again, I'd rather see it out at the same time as you're telling about gameplay, right? All this stuff like strategic depth again is, is just industry buzzwords. Um, so is emotional emergent storytelling, but you can talk about that in your turns, right? How is the story emerging? You can talk, the unique social experiences I think is probably your biggest selling point. And just saying this isn't as good as demonstrating where is that in the game? Where's that experience in the game? How do I get that by playing cards? I don't understand. Help me understand. Make it make sense, right? Uh, what's inside? Let's see what we got here. That's good, good, good. Are the card sleeves actually important? It's cool if they are. It's different. And that's kind of an interesting thing. Like if somebody said, oh, if I saw that on a, on a thing, I'd say, oh, what are you doing that the cards are, the card sleeves are actually important? That's, that's neat. Um, and then we got the cards. This. Okay, I see. It's interesting. Right. And so here, because you've named everything, now I, I am intrigued. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> what do diary cards? Because you talked about storytelling and diary cards. But again, I think it'd be better exemplified in a turn order, a round of play. That's all I'm saying here. But other yeah. than that, I, I am super intrigued by this, Katie. I think it looks really neat. And then these yeah. are actually important. Yes. Yeah. So tell me, how are they important yeah. in the game? That is a differentiator. That is something that, you know, I think needs to go on this. It's not the same as, oh, I'll talk to you about it, like an expansion or something. This is like, if it's mechanically important, you need to talk about it here. Because if a publisher sees this and goes, 48 card sleeves, why is that important? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> ah, skip yeah. it. But if you said yeah. mechanically important because you you know the backs of the cards are different and blah blah blah, and that you write a little thing here like she reveals this by pulling out the card from her sleeve and blah, amazing everybody laughs and has fun. Um, it sounds trite when I say it, but I want to read that story. <laughs> I really really do. Uh, now I'm fascinated, Katie, by this game. So you've done you've done a good job in fascinating me, but not explaining it to me. And it needs to do both, right? It's got to leave that little air of mystery, which I think is perfect for this game, to be honest. <laughs> but some things can't be left, like that 48 card sleeves. I, I can't not know what that's about. Right. Cool. 
Awesome. All right. And I think we have one. If you have time, we have one sure. more. I got, I, yep. I got time. I got All time right. for your group. Awesome. Your group's uh, awesome. All right, let me just get this up here. Uh, this is from uh, Maxwell. Uh, and where did I throw this on? Uh, there it is. Cool. All right. Um, all right, can you see that? Yeah, can you scroll up so I can see? Yeah. Dungeons, the Dungeons of Dyad. So professionally, I use dyad to mean a pair of people communicating. So this is interesting. Uh, ages 8 plus. Um, okay. So with ages eight plus, just make sure you've tested it at age eight, right? That it doesn't have a lot of language, that the math is fairly simple. It doesn't have to be super simple, but it, it probably shouldn't be like multiplication or definitely not division. Like eight is like plus and minus and starting to do, you know, uh, more complex math patterns, numerical functions, one to six players. And we got the components here. 93 poker size cards, 24 tokens, 19 cubes, one jumbo size cards, ah, and six player boards. Okay, cool. So again, you're going to have a lot of waste on your card sheets, but that's the way that's going to go. Um, uh, let's see here. Unless you can use the cards to make up your cubes or something. So there, there are ways to make use of all those cards if you need to. A uh, cooperative puzzle game where cards are simultaneously played on neighboring teams while you work to maximize your team's potential. Uh, Maxwell, that's, that needs to kind of go. Like, not go like off the page, but that is like all industry buzzwords. Like, it's all buzzwords. And it's probably better to work it into your first line here. Like, mighty heroes have assembled to take on a dangerous dungeon for the chance to de defeat foes. Like, if you can merge both of those together, you'll have a more compelling log line where the publisher gets the sense of mechanisms and thematics and experience at the same time, right? Because that's what, that's what you want to do. Um, having them so blatantly separated uh, makes it feel separate that's not integrated, right? That it's not uh, well well merged, that it's maybe tacked on. So you don't want to convey that through your writing, that this is tacked on. You want to convey that, oh, it's thoughtful and integrated and all that kind of stuff. Um, so uh, just in terms of art, I'm assuming you don't own that art, um, which is fine. Uh, you might get heck from some people, that's your choice. Uh, in this MMORPG, MMORPG themed game. Um, so using acronyms that most people in the industry might know should be okay. But you might want to also write down massively multiplayer online or role playing game, uh, e.g. World of Warcraft. Uh, just because you may be pitching to some people who don't know what that means. Like legit, just don't know what that means. Or they don't know the acronym, but they played Warcraft, World of Warcraft, or they've done neither. So uh, here's another cardinal sin is making people feel stupid. Like never, ever, ever insult people's intelligence by leaving stuff off the table. <laughs> and what's a person who reads the in brackets? That means multiple. They're not, they're not going to think you think they are, you know, unintelligent. You're gonna they're going to think, oh, this person is you know, writing it out for other people. And that's fine. Um, players take on the role of squad of squad leaders as they simultaneously place heroes on neighboring teams to deal the required amount of damage by balancing class powers and forming elemental matches. Uh, damage is totaled when the teams are fully assembled and players choose which heroes to carry over as they move deeper into the dungeon. Okay, so... There's a lot of repetition here from the cooperative puzzle game, simultaneous matching, all this kind of stuff. Uh, again, so I would rather really just read it kind of once. Uh, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to be beating people over the head with the repetition of the words and the phrases all the time. Um, cooperation is key. Um, players are able to see what they need. Okay, and that's, that's good. And having it that it's a co-op definitely at the top is helpful because you would need to know that. That's the context that you're providing, right? 
Um, okay, so again, I have no idea how what these pictures mean. I don't know what these icons do. I don't know any of these things. I don't know why I need 19 cubes. Um, so what I would love to see is an explanation. Like this this picture over here with all like the six cards surrounding the one card in the middle, and I got no clue. I don't know what's happening there. I guess, you know, sets are like, icons are half matched and matching up stuff, which is super cool if that's what you're doing. But explain it. Like this doesn't explain the game well enough for me to say, oh, I get it. Um, it might make me ask a whole lot of questions, or I might just skip it. It's like, no, I don't get I don't get it from looking at it. That's that's not enough for me to say yes, let's go. Um players blah, 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 blah. again I, I'd, I'd like to see like an explanation of what is happening like what's the card in the middle why is that there is that the enemy i'm gonna guess it's the enemy you know as a game designer i can tell that's probably the enemy and i'm trying to match up these icons to do damage to the enemy and if i match the icons i do double damage or something like that i don't know uh but it would be better if you just told me <laughs> rather than leaving me to guess. So again, like I said, some things are good when you leave a little off. You want that communication to continue. But some stuff, if I looked at this, like, again, remember, these are things that people are going to take home with them. If they don't bring your prototype home with them with your rules, this is all I got. And if I looked at this, like, two weeks later as I was cleaning out my briefcase or my backpack or whatever luggage I was carting stuff back from Gen Con in, I, I wouldn't know what this was if I didn't get to play the game, right? If you just showed me this. So you really want to be careful with that kind of stuff. Can you scroll up a bit again, Mike? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Okay, so you 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 put uh, over a third of your page as the title. That's not great. It's not horrible bad, but it's also not necessary. Like again, I would rather see an example of play, and I can't. You can't really teach the game easily off of this, off of this cell sheet that I know of because I, I don't know how to play the game. So uh, it's just something that you need to need to I think clean up a little bit in terms of what's on the page. It looks great though. Like I mean, I, I'm guessing you're a graphic designer or somebody that you know is a graphic designer or your team is a graphic designer because this is, you know, clean AF. But <laughs> the uh, the content isn't isn't like triggering me the way that some of the other content did. So we've actually seen three very different um very different cell sheets, which is neat uh, and, and kind of telling in a way. Uh, the first one with the dogs was actually probably the best in terms of content, but graphically, you know, could use some work. This one here in the middle is definitely graphically superior to all the other ones, but is really, you know, going kind of full bore on these heavy uh, terminology laden phrases that really don't give me an example of the experience, don't really tell me about the fun parts of the game. It's it's very mechanical without even telling me what the, mechanical, the mechanics are, which is strange to me. So, And then the middle one, which is super intriguing, but again, it's missing that whole kind of piece of how is the game actually played? You want people, this is stuff people take away with them. They may not get to see your game. This is like maybe you hand it to them in the elevator as you're going up to you know, Big Bar on 2 at Origins, right? You want to give this to them so they have an idea. They say, oh, hey, look at that. Oh, look, I understand this. This is good. Let's talk to that person tomorrow. Let's give them an email. Say, can you come by my booth? I'd like to try your game. Uh, so far out of all three of them, the only one that I would probably say that to was the first one that I said, okay, I know enough that I would make be able to make a guess on if it's worth my time. That's not to say that any of these other games are good or bad. It's just every publisher only has so much time to see pitches, even virtual ones. And so I need to make a value judgment. And so you need to provide me with the information I need to make that value judgment. The first one does that, perhaps because it's a simpler game. I don't know. The second one is missing a lot of pieces, but is intriguing just in, in the presentation of it. And 
the last one is graphically superior, just doesn't give me enough information to make any decisions on that aren't just like words I've heard a thousand times before. There's like no differentiation in it, right? Which is the big factor for number two. Number two, the um, the one about relationships and stuff, there's like huge differentiation in it that, that grabs my eye, that makes me think about it, right? And if, if Katie just told us a little bit more, it'd be like, I'm all in on that, at least to see it, right? This one here, Maxwell, just looks like kind of run of the mill. Every other game that people are making, tell me what is different about it. Tell me what the experience is. Tell me why I should play this game, but give me examples from in-game to do that. Again, it's a lot of uh, buzzwords. Cool? Awesome. Well, that was uh, fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation and the feedback on on everybody's sell sheets. Um, I, you know, in the Discord, people are already saying like, "Yep, great, good. I'm going to do that. I'm going to make those changes." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, so, I don't mean to harp yeah. on anything. No, 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 no. It's all good. Uh, you know, we've got a a speed pitching event coming up for some of our members, and so this, mm -hmm. is, this is so so useful because that's going to be a huge part of it. Is you know, those publishers need those uh, need those sell sheets um, for uh, before and even after the pitch. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're, they're going to use them as like short forms, like just like, do I want to see this? Do I really care about this? They're going to use to take notes on. Um, so the cleaner you can do it graphically, the better your wording is. So it's both show and tell. Um, definitely lean towards show more than tell. Words like if you don't don't like like walls of words, walls of words aren't useful. White space is super important. Uh, try to like boil it down as much as you can uh, to as few words as possible, without without losing you know all the words that you might need. <laughs> it's an art. It's it's seriously an yeah. art, and you'll get better as you do more of them. Um, so yeah, I, I wish everybody the best at the speed dating uh, pitch fest, pitch pitchathon, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Uh, and again, just reach out to me if you need any more help. Um, you have all access to my Twitter, um, my website, which has like my email and stuff like that. All the stuff for Meeple Syrup, uh, which is the show that I host with Erica and Jesse on Wednesday nights at nine o'clock Eastern Standard Time or Eastern Daylight Saving Time, whatever, whatever we're in now. I know right. I lost an hour yeah. of sleep, but I, I don't know if that's standard. I think it's daylight. Um, yeah. Eastern Time, how's that? And then uh, for the rest of it, yeah, just uh, check us out. And we have lots of good stuff coming up from designers, graphic designers, illustrators, publishers, all sorts of people in the industry uh, coming to the show to talk about their experiences. And Yeah, it's great. Stuff. And not your standard as well. You know, like no. you have people on that, like I've, I've never seen anywhere else, you know, which is really awesome. And walks of parts of the industry that are, you know, not often, um, uh, you know, I don't want to say glamorized, but you know what I mean? Like uh, out there and in public, so... That's great. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, we are very intentional with that. Yeah. Um, we intentionally pick people who aren't featured in everything else all the time. Uh, we have a very intentional mandate to uh, feature uh, designers who are from marginalized populations. Uh, we are all Canadian, but we don't just focus on Canada, but we do often focus on Canada. <laughs> um, so if you are, you know, pro representation matters maple syrup is a great place to learn about designers from other parts of the world from other cultures other ethnicities other walks of life absolutely cool awesome well thank you again to uh, our sponsors for this whole series tabletop network and new voices in gaming uh and everyone on patreon and thank you so much sen for this uh you know we, we wanted to produce a thing on uh, sell sheets you were the first uh, and only name that we thought of. <laughs> so we're so glad you said yes, because if it was no, we, we wouldn't have anybody. So you could have talked to Jay. Jay's Jay's also yeah, here. Sure. <laughs> my, my design partner. <laughs> awesome. So I just want to tell everyone that next week uh, we're gonna have uh, Nikki Valens uh, talk at Tabletop Network uh, about representation. Yeah. Uh, we're gonna release He's that awesome. on their, their, this YouTube channel. Uh, next week it's gonna be on Saturday, uh, not on our normal Sunday. Um, and then uh, Two weeks from today, we're going to have actually uh, Omari Akil talking about um, how to run a Kickstarter, right? Uh, which is going to be really, really cool. He just finished up uh, one for Hoop Gods, which was awesome. 
Uh, and so we're really excited for that. Um, so bring your notebooks, bring your questions to that. Uh, but again, uh, I'll put up a title card at the end of this and leave it up for a little bit so the chat has time to, to close out. But again, Sen, thank you so much. I uh, really, really loved it. And uh, we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. I will. Thanks so much. Awesome. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.